Golf Smarter, number 575, published on January 17, 2017. Here are six rules for new golfers, no matter what their age. With Scott Cipherline. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Scott. Hi, Fred. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Oh, well, gee. It's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you very much for agreeing. The, the reason um, we came together is uh, you made some comments on LinkedIn in a golfer's group that, uh, that intrigued me, talking about rules for new golfers. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, although the Golf Smarter audience uh, is a mixture of new golfers who are just getting addicted to the game and, and players who are um, not only um, not PGA Tour players, but we have PGA instructors uh, from all over the world um, and people who are always trying to get family members to introduce to the game. So I'd love to talk about your idea, uh, rules for new golfers, and um, why we need to have rules for new golfers. Sure. Well, uh, just the game, the way the game is introduced to people, uh, it's in a manner that um, I believe is leading to the, to the cause, the fact that a lot of people play for a couple weeks just trying the game out, and then they quit shortly thereafter, and they don't stick with the game. So the game is losing more players, just as many players, if not more players, than it's gaining every week. And they're in- introduced to the game in a manner that, that is really for expert players, and it's not for new golfers so much. Uh, the courses are designed for expert players, and these new golfers are thrown into situations where they have to play from the expert player tees, they have to play by the expert player rules, and it's really discouraging. Uh, it takes them too long to get to the green, and they're told that they have to keep up a certain pace of play, that they're not capable of keeping up yet because they're not skilled enough, and they're forced to play these expert player tee boxes. Uh, by the time they get to the green, it's already been 15 minutes or so, and, and they're holding up the group behind them. So they're told to pick up their ball. So if you were um, entered to a new game and, and you could never finish it, you, would, you were, every hole you were told, well, just pick it up, just pick it up. Uh, how would that make you feel? You pr- would probably want to quit in a hurry. So that's why I've designed some, some new golfer rules uh, so that we can avoid those types of situations. So tell us some of your rules. So what we do is uh, with a new golfer, the, the first three, I've got six rules total. Uh, you probably know that the, the USGA rule book has 34 rules and there's thousands of decisions and hundreds of pages within all, all, all those rules. But, but uh, my new golfer rules all fit on one page. And there's six of them. The first three are designed based on the new golfer tee box system. And when starting the game of golf, you should really start at the 50-yard marker. You shouldn't start where the expert player tees are. And the game of golf is is designed, it should be played to a score of five or better on every hole as an average, as a general idea. And in order to do that, the new golfer needs to be able to get on or near the green in just two shots because they're typically going to take uh, anywhere from at least two, if not three or four putts. And we want them to score five or better right away because it's not it's not very fun to score 10 or 12 on a hole. So we set them up at the 50-yard marker as their, their official tee box starting off. And the goal is to get them on or near the green in two shots and then two or three putts. We use a graduation system so that once they score a five or better from 50 yards, then they can graduate 25 yards, so they tee off to the, they tee off at the 75-yard marker on the next hole. And that gives them some motivation, uh, gives them an award, basically, for scoring five or better. They get to graduate to a farther back tee box. And then once they can score five or better from 75, then they can go to 100, and it keeps going. And I find oftentimes when I do these in junior camps, these kids are graduating to the 300-yard marker uh, within the week. So they, they actually progress quite quickly. Uh, it doesn't take a very long time to progress. And they have a lot of fun with it. They are encouraged. Uh, they score five or better. Uh, they don't have to deal with eights, nines, tens, twelves, fifteens that a lot of new golfers have to deal with and the frustration of trying to cover 
five football field uh, as a new golfer. So that's rule number one is uh, where to tee off from. Uh, rule number two, we talked about you must hit all shots off of the tee until you get on the green. That includes from the fairway, which, by the way, you don't always have to tee off from the fairway. Uh, new golfers can tee off from the rough and change their angles and, and make some, for some new challenges, even though they're just going from 50 yards. But I do suggest that they use a tee. It doesn't mean that they should tee it high. It should be teed low, uh, but just teed at a height at which it gives them a perfect lie. And then rule number three are the clubs that um, they should be using. I uh, see so many new golfers are introduced to the game with a 10-degree driver, and they have a 50-mile-per-hour club head speed. And those things just don't, <laughs> they don't match up, and it's frustrating because, because they can't get it off the ground. So we have um, the clubs to use are uh, once you graduate beyond 100 yards, then you can use a 7-wood or a 9-wood. Inside of 100 yards, the clubs to use are 7-iron, 8-iron, 9-iron, pitching wedge, sand wedge, and putter. And then all the other clubs are for decorative purposes only. So those are, uh, those are the first three rules. And then those are really all you ever need unless you're in a situation where your playing partners refuse to allow you to play by those rules or you're in a scramble or some other type of event and you actually are forced to play by the expert player tee boxes, um, then, I, then I actually implement rules 4, 5, and 6. And those rules, uh, number 4, uh, is you do not have to finish a hole. Uh, if, it's, if it's just a frustrating hole for you, you can pick it up. Uh, I don't encourage that. I encourage you to follow the first three rules, but if you are in a situation... Uh, where you've actually been forced to play the expert tee boxes, and rule number four uh, should apply. And number five, uh, if a hole looks too difficult, you just skip it. There's no reason to frustrate yourself with this game. And then number six, and your score is not in relation to par. So if you're playing the expert player tee boxes, uh, you're certainly not going to be scoring five or better. So you don't want to get hung up in your score. Uh, you don't want to be thinking that you're scoring eight, nine, or ten. So you focus more on your score as being relative to hitting good shots. And so an example of that may be that you may have a goal of hitting two good shots on a hole, or you might have a, have a goal of hitting one good shot on a hole, and that would be your score, a one, or a two would be your score instead of 10, 12, or, or 14 that a typical new golfer would have when playing from the, the um, expert player tee boxes. I and so that's the that's summary of the, the six rules for new golfers. I, 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 I think it's really interesting. There's some great ideas in there. Do you generally use these for juniors, or do you use this for any aged golfer that's new to the sport? No, I use them for all aged golfers, any type of new golfer, regardless of um, their physical ability, regardless of their age, regardless of uh, whether they're male or female. Uh, all new golfers, I encourage to use utilize this rule. E- even if they can hit at 200 yards right away, I still want them to learn the short game first so that they learn scoring ability mm-hmm. and then work their way back. Mm-hmm. Now, oftentimes we find that someone that can hit at 200 yards works their way back quicker than someone who can only hit at 75 yards. But still, the, um, the short game is, is obviously most important in the scoring ability. I've noticed that as well that people who um, have a you know a natural ability to swing a golf club, uh, good hand eye coordination, but then you you know they can just hit the golf ball as hard as they can hit the golf ball. But when it comes into you know hitting a, a fifty to seventy five yard shot, they're completely baffled because they don't know the difference of the of what each club can do for them, or the fact that they don't have to take a full swing every time. Right, and they, they've they rarely ever taken anything but a full swing, yeah. so they don't have any type of awareness of club head. Uh, one of the things I test with all my clients, not just new golfers, but when they first come to see I don't have them start out hitting full shots. I ask them to hit it, hit it 40 yards or 30 yards, or I might make reference to saying something like take a half swing and they, they have no awareness of what a, what a half swing is. They have no awareness of what it requires to hit 30 yards. Uh, so they might start hitting shots 80 or 90 yards right away, 
and they don't even realize that that's not 30 yards. There's just no awareness because all they've ever done is full swing. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, and what kind of reaction have you received from this concept, these six rules? I've received a lot of positive reaction. Uh, I've received some questions, like people say, well, is my course even going to allow me to do this? And um, I, that's a good question. It's a great question. Is I've it, never actually heard of a golf course that, that has a rule that you have to tee off from the tee boxes. Right. Um, you can certainly tee off from 50 yards, 100 yards. I've never heard of a golf course not allowing that. So Right, um, and I would think that any golf course, if if you're saying, look, I'm bringing out somebody who's fresh to the sport, um, but I have a way to encourage to keep the pace of play up, how are they going to discourage that? Right. I mean, it's, it's and they're going to if the person's paying cash, they're going to take their money. Sure. To play. And you brought up the you brought up the point earlier that do they have to play eighteen holes? And certainly no. There's a lot of eighteen hole courses that allow you to play nine. There's a lot of Not eighteen enough. hole courses that allow you to play three holes or six holes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's similar to the way that I introduce my children to uh, baseball take them to a baseball game, and I encourage anyone who has little kids and wants to take their kid to a baseball game, treat them like the starting pitcher. If they make it through five innings, they get the victory, they can go home. Right. <laughs> you don't have to stay for the whole thing. And um, you probably wouldn't have a new baseball player start off by facing 90-mile-per-hour fastballs. So you probably put it on a tee, right? Yeah, exactly. So why would we have new golfers starting off from 500 yards where the all the expert players tee off from. Uh, it's an excellent point. Um, and, and when you presented this in LinkedIn, what kind of resistance did you get? Because there's a, a really interesting mixture of people who chime in on these, uh, these group discussions. What, what is the reaction that you received in LinkedIn? I received incredible reaction. It was amazing. I received an average of 9 to 10 comments in each group that I had posted it in. I had posted it in about 40 different groups, so I had uh, several hundred comments um, from this uh, discussion that I posted, all of which were positive. A few were just questioning if, it, if a course would allow this to happen, mm -hmm. uh, but everything was incredibly positive. Amazing. Amazing. Well, that's great. I, I, I encourage it. I think it's a great idea. I, I, I will definitely remember this so that when I go out to, and I, I play the nine hole course here frequently when I go out there and I'm, you know, clearly playing with people who've never played before. It's like, you know what, let's make it easy on yourself and, and make you enjoy yourself a bit more. Let's try these rules. I think it's a great way to go. Right, and then just, just provide them with the graduation system. So there's continuous reward every, every, for every success. Exactly. Exactly. Great idea. Great idea. All right. Now, there's one other thing. I got to bring this up, too, because you, you also make a claim that um, the first time I heard this claim is when I left a voicemail for you. You said, I can cure your slice in five swings I could, or yeah. fix your slice in five swings. And you have an ebook about this as well. Yes, uh, it's, it's a free ebook that people can get off of my website when they register for my uh, monthly newsletter, which is also free. Uh, but it focuses on four core areas that cause a slice. And uh, most golfers that slice the ball have one to two of these. They, they rarely have all four, but usually they have at least one, one to two of them. Um, so do we have a, a minute or two? Would you like to go into a couple I of I would love to go into this. Take as much time as you need, please. Okay. Uh, one of them that's um, a small factor, and most golfers think it's the number one factor. They all think that they swing outside to in, and that's what's causing their slice. That's really not what causes their slice. It's a small factor that can influence their slice. But I just want to put that out there. Uh, we're not going to cover that today uh, because it's not a major factor. What wow. I am going to cover is um, a major factor that causes a slice, and that is the fact that golfers don't understand what a correct release is and how to get into good impact position. Most of them think a release is the hands releasing the club head, and that actually causes the left wrist to get into a cocked position. And a cup position is a 
technical golf term for the fact that the forearm of the left, assuming you're right-handed, or if you're uh, uh, left-handed, then it would be your right wrist and your left and your right forearm. But as a right-handed player, it'd be your left forearm and your left hand. They get into a cupped position where the left hand is bent in relation to the left forearm. We could also look at it as a lead arm, so that if you're right, if you're left-handed, you could look at it as your right arm, uh, the one that's closest to the target. So when they don't rotate over, the face stays facing the target, which most a lot of slicers think that their club face is supposed to face the target through and past impact and swing down the target line. They've also been told to swing down the target line. So they try and do that with their hands instead of their forearms. So when that happens, the club face never squares up. It adds loft, so they oftentimes hit it higher than they should and shorter than they should, and it curves to the right. Once we get them to understand how to use the lead forearm, which is the left for a right-handed player and the right for a left-handed player, they can actually release the club properly, which is a rotational forearm release rather than a hand cupping release. And that instantly, within five swings or less, uh, stops their slice. Are you saying hands cupping? Yes. Explain that to the me. The lead hand. Right. Not the tra- trail hand. We're talking about the lead hand, which would be the left for a, a right-handed player and the right for a left-handed player. Okay, and explain to me what you mean by cupping. I mean, I know this is yeah. not video, so it's a little harder to describe, but you're doing a great job right. so far. Uh, cupping is a golf term that is that means that the left hand or the lead hand uh, for a right-handed player is in a bent position in relation to their forearm, when actually it should be into a flat or slightly bowed position, which should be... Um, Bent backwards? Reverse of a, a bowed would be bent backwards re, in re, a reverse of a cup position. Most players that hook the ball are in too much of a bowed position with their lead uh, lead hand, with their mm-hmm. left hand if they're a right-handed player. Mm-hmm. So if we can get it real close to flat or slightly bowed, encourages a draw. But cupping that lead wrist uh, encourages a slice. Now, you could say that, well, I watched for couples and who his lead wrist is cupped at the top of his swing. Keep in mind that's at the top of the swing, it's not at impact. Immediately starting his downswing within the first couple feet of his downswing, he really flattens that left wrist out so it gets flat to his left forearm. And that allows him to avoid hitting big slices. Well, I tried never to compare myself to any guy who's on the tour. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't help me at all. Well, right, because they, they have different body types and they're much exactly. more athletic than, than most of us. Exactly. exactly. So that's um, that's the major slice factor. Uh-huh. Uh, I highlight three other slice factors in that ebook uh, that that are probably causing most of your uh, subscribers uh, the issues. But that that's definitely the main one. And oftentimes, if if that's at least the one that they're doing, they can cure their slice. Uh, very quickly, sometimes in one or two swings. And is it the type of thing that somebody can correct on their own, or do they need someone to work with who can watch them, or would video help? How would how would you do this without an instructor, or is it possible? Well, absolutely it's possible, but Fred, it depends on your learning style. Some players learn better by video, so it would help them to video it and see the difference. Uh, not just what, what they're doing, to video a tour player and see where they're lead forearm and lead hand is at impact just before impact and after impact to see the type of motion that happens through the impact zone. Uh, if they're not a good visual learner, then um, they may have to have more of a feel type drill. And they may have to work with an instructor who can help them feel that type of motion. Uh, some people are are good at uh, conceptualizing the motion just by reading about it without even seeing pictures. Mm-hmm. So it depends on their learning style. Of course. Of course. All right, so you, you said there's four core areas. You've just covered two. You want to sh- keep continue to share? Uh, sure, we can cover a couple more. Uh, number uh, two in the ebook is uh, lead hand grip position. And lead hand grip position can encourage a fade or a slice. 
when you only see one knuckle or zero knuckles of your lead hand when you look down at your grip. Uh, in order to have that where you'd only see one or zero knuckles of your lead hand, the grip, the physical grip of the club would have to be in your palm. It wouldn't be in your fingers. If it's in your fingers, you're going to see one to one and a half knuckles, possibly two knuckles when you look down. If you had it too much in your fingers and you had a hook-type grip, you'd see three to four knuckles. Hmm. So a neutral grip would be one and a half to two knuckles. A fade or slice grip would be one or less knuckles, which would be more in the palm. The grip part would be more in the palm. And then uh, a hook-type grip would be if you see three three knuckles or four knuckles, and the grip is too much in the fingers, and the hand is wrapped too far over the grip. Now, there are a lot of slicers that intentionally use a three- or four-knuckle grip, and they that doesn't help them at all because they still don't understand the concept of forearm rotation, and their right hand still pushes up and under and cups the left wrist so badly that it actually overcompensates for the three- to four-knuckle grip, and they still result in a slice. So you could have a golfer who fixes their lead hand grip position but still slices the ball just because they don't understand the concept of impact and how the hands and forearms work through the swing. So that is a factor. It's just not as uh, big of a factor as the, the main one that we highlighted today. Hmm. Okay. Awesome. Uh, and then um, the uh, other one that we covered was the over-the-top, out-to-in swing direction. Mm-hmm. And the other, the last one is just cupping your lead wrist in the backswing and in the downswing so that it makes it very difficult to square it up and, and rotate it over in the impact. So that would be an example of Fred Couples top of the backswing position where he actually compensates for it in the downswing uh, so he's able to get away with it. And there are a lot of other players on tour that get into a cup position at the top. So it's not an absolute, but for a lot of us amateurs that struggle in manipulating our downswing, if we set the club in the hand position at the top into a square position, which would be a flat lead wrist to the lead forearm at the top of the swing, it makes it that much easier to have it flat at impact. Fabulous. So those are our four uh, factors that cause the slice, and then uh, the ebook goes more in depth on how to fix those. All right, and it's a free ebook. Yes. And again, please tell us how to get to uh, to download the book. Sure, you just go to Grand Rapids Golf Lesson.com. That's Grand Rapids Golf Lesson.com. And over on the right hand side, it uh, gives you a uh, place where you can enter your email to receive that ebook, and you can also receive the uh, free monthly golf instruction newsletter. Is it safe to assume that Grand Rapids is the Grand Rapids of Michigan? That is Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's correct. And and tell us about where you're teaching there. And uh, I'm sure that we have some people who are local to your area that uh, may want to look you up. And I teach out at the Highlands Golf Club. Some of the locals may also know know it as the Elks Golf Club. Why is it called by two different names? Uh, there is an Elks Lodge there, a oh. uh, private Elks Lodge that's um, uh, right next to the golf shop and the, and the clubhouse uh, so they also so it's been a partnership for many years oh okay well great Scott thanks so much for your time and, and uh, your insights your valuable lessons and uh, your commentary on, on the open <laughs> I appreciate the time that you spent with us today again it's Scott Cypherline of GrandRapidsGolfLesson.com thanks Scott Fred it's been outstanding thank you very much <laughs>